the developing a coaching philosophy um, is something that I was really thinking about as I came here to, to coach. And it's something that we really thought about, me and Coach Justin, with coaching football. And I'll, I, I'm, I'm gonna get to the part where we show our, um, kind of our first drafts of our coaching, our offensive and defensive philosophies for football. But it was really a guiding principle and I think it really helped establish um, exactly uh, what our vision was and what we wanted to accomplish as a coaching staff and what we um, what we wanted to get out of um, what we wanted the athletes to get out of um, so every coach should have one and it, this is not only a um, one of the reasons why you should have one is whenever you interview for uh, positions for coaching positions you already have this written down and you can go and you can show it to uh, the interviewer and it looks really good if you have a clear concise coaching philosophy and it really helps uh, the interviewer to and a lot of interviewers will ask hey uh, what's your coaching philosophy what's your philosophy of offense and if you have a clear cut philosophy and if it really meshes with their vision um, it can be really powerful in the interview experience. Um, the other thing is, and more importantly, it's uh, this document is going to guide your whole vision as a program. And it's going to help you, um, we're going to do another workshop on culture, building a culture, which um, I've talked to some college athletes and they, they say it's the most important thing in any in any program is the culture that, that is built there. So having a, a clear coaching philosophy helps establish and build that culture. Um, okay, so what is a philosophy of coaching? Um, it's a set of core beliefs. So what are your core beliefs? What are some of your most basic core beliefs? Um, did I hand you this yet? Oh, yeah, I did one. What, what are your core beliefs um, what are your core beliefs when it comes to basketball? What are the most important things? It's a set, set of guiding principles. Like I said, it, it's going to guide everything you do as a coach. Um, as a home base of truths. And um, like I said, you should have one for yourself. Your players should see it and should know it too. Um, that way they can hold you accountable too if, if uh, something's not... Um, there, there's one coach that said that um, his part of his coaching philosophy was to build players up, build players up. And then there's a, a there's a player that said, "Hey, coach, you you talk about wanting to build us up, but why are you always riding us and why are you always tearing us down and yelling?" And the coach had to do some introspection and say, "Hey, you know what? You're right, and I apologize." And, and we're going to uh, get better from this, okay? So his players knew his philosophy, and they're able to hold him accountable, and they're um, they're able to return to that core set of beliefs, okay? Um, the other thing about coaching philosophy and about any philosophy is they're fluid. They're always um, they're always changing. So. Th they're malleable, so you don't, it's not like when you create a coaching philosophy, it's set in stone, right? It's um, it's something that should always be revisited, something that should always be, because um, you're you're going to change as a person, your experiences as a coach are going to um, change how you view coaching and all of that, and the game itself. yeah, the game itself will change. It, uh, so always come and revisit this. But once you have that initial document, it's a lot easier than to go and make those little changes. Okay? Um, where do you get one? So uh, introspection, we're going to be doing some of that today. Um, and then also, again, beg, borrow, and still. Look at as, as many drafts, and you, you can find these online, you can find these from other coaches. Um, 
lots of coaches have these out there so you can look and you can say, oh, um, they, I like this, how, how they organize their coaching philosophy. Or um, they have, I, I don't like this about their philosophy and I'd rather do this, okay? So uh, introspection and, and steal from other people Okay, um, where do you start? Well, first off, um, in the packet, number one, why do you coach? Why do you coach? Um, I think that's the most important um, question. Why do we want to coach? And for different people, it might be different. Um, one of the reasons why I want to coach is I love competition and I love to compete and I miss that as a player and um, part of it's a little selfish but I want to go and compete still um, and then another part of why I coach is um, there's so many really important values that I learn as an athlete and go through experiences of winning and losing and teamwork and, and development and hard work and, and all of all these values that you learn as a player, and I want to pass that down to as many people as I can because I know that those values will be so important to others as, uh, throughout their lives. So um, that first question, why do I coach, is really introspective. It's going to be really important to your philosophy um, and take some, some time to reflect on that and to answer that. What kind of experience did you have? So these are reflections. What kind of experience did you have as a youth? Junior high, high school, college. Did you play, if you played anything in college? Um, build on those experiences, okay? What did you like, what didn't you like? Okay, um, another really important question. What kind of experience do you want for your athletes? Okay, um, important driving question. Do you want your athletes to um, learn something from this season? Uh, what specific things do you want them to learn? Um, do you want them to, um, to feel like Feel, feel the feeling of development where they're, they're building on skills, okay? Uh, do you want them to, um, um, just reflect on that question, what kind of experience? And I added that as one of the questions in the packets because it's, it's one of those important ones. Um, okay, do I have the knowledge, skills, and disposition to accomplish what I want to do as a coach? Um, all of these are different things. So I have the knowledge, skills, and disposition to accomplish what I want to accomplish. Um, if not, do I know where I can get the knowledge, skills, and disposition to accomplish it? Okay. Um, again, the question, why do I want to coach? Do I know what I need to know to be that coach? Okay, what kind of coach do I want to be? What kind of coach do I want to be? And do I know what I need to know to be that kind of coach? Now, um, I'm of the opinion that there's always things to be learned and always things to be, the, the game is always changing. There's always techniques and things that you can learn to help you become not only a better player, but a better coach. And um, one of the standards that um, I think it, every coach should have is coaches should be masters of the game, uh, players should be students of the game. So as a coach, you're going to do as much as you can to learn as, as many different things as possible. Um, and yeah, and um, you, you gotta expect your, your, your players to be students of the game. Um, because they need to learn what the game more about the game too, and um, 
I have an example from football of, of this in a second. When will I know what I need to know to be that coach? Okay, so what will it take to know what I need to know to be that kind of coach? All right, uh, do I have the drive to be the best? Now, we just talked about being masters of the game and students of the game. Um, that drive has to be there if you want to be the best. Um, here's an example. Um, coaching football this last season. Um, I know we didn't win uh, the state championship, but that was our ultimate goal. Uh, the team has never been nowhere close to that. And um, we wanted to establish a, a culture and a philosophy to help us get there. Um, and we had, luckily. No, no. Sorry, I have to interrupt for a minute. When you get a minute, you guys get a minute, will you run those kids out of here so the cleaning crew can finish cleaning? Yeah, they're all still, the kids are still in here. Are they, are they done with pitchers? They're done with, Joe, Jacob's finished. Okay, um, so do we have the drive to be the best? And here's here's my example. Uh, you know, Coach J Justin, you amazing coach. He, uh, as a coaching staff, one of the things we want to emphasize with our own coaching staff and with our players is watching film and film breakdown. It's uh, something essential for football, but it helps in every single sport. And we watch so much film that even the smallest details. What's up, coach? What's up? <laughs> oh, thank you. Just talking about you. Were you? Yeah. I'm, I'm talking not. smack. I don't know. I thought you guys were talking about how good looking I am, dude. Um, but the smallest details. So, like, uh, watch so much film that Coach Justin eventually found that one of the guards um, in Hayden, the championship or the semifinal game that we're watching, one of the guards would indicate uh, whether it's a pass or or run. Something that um, after talking with like other coaches, we realized that they they didn't know, right? Because we watched a lot more film than, than they did. Mogion didn't know. Um, do you have the drive to be the best? Um, and that really helps our, our defense, right? We, uh, we, I know we lost to Hayden, but held them to the fewest points that they scored all year. And it was the closest game that they played all year. Um, we also required our players to uh, to look at four plays a day. They had to watch uh, film four plays a day. They had to write out the plays, write out their responsibilities to stop each play. So uh, how much time are you willing to put into it? Um, what am I willing to give up to be the best? It's a sacrifice. I know coaching's a sacrifice. One of the reasons why um, I, I after sitting down with my, with my family, I, I came to the decision that I won't be able to give that sacrifice for the basketball season. Um, and, and what am I willing to give up to be the best? Time, energy, uh, willing to look at new ideas, willing to um, adapt and adjust, okay? Willing to learn new things willing to talk, to branch out and outreach and talk to the very best. Another uh, good thing that Coach Justin does is he talks to everyone and the best people. And um, he'll network that way and get new ideas from, from the best coaches, from the most successful high school coaches, from college coaches, he's, he's branched out and, and talked to them. What am I willing to uh, give up to be the best? And uh, I know, unfortunately, a lot of times spouses for coaches, uh, they got to bear a lot, right? Because um, it's, it's a lot of time and a lot of commitment to be the very best coach you can be. What does uh, be the best even mean to me? 
okay, it, what's, what, what's my standards for these events? Is it uh, to build a, a program where you're competing for states every year? Um, and not just not just reaping the talent that comes. Is it is it um, is it getting the most out of your players every year? Uh, you need to define that for yourself. What are my priorities as a coach? Okay. And then um, are these in line with who I am and who I want to be as a person? Because they should be. Again, your core values should translate to you as a coach. Um, developing personal goals. Um, I'm going to skip through this one so we can get through um, some of the other stuff, but a lot of this is introspective. Where do I, and you guys have these slides, where do I see myself in five years, 10 years? What are my goals? Um, am I taking the path to get there? All right. Um, so here's a couple of, of different values that can play into uh, the kinds of things that we might see in a coaching philosophy, okay? Wounds objectives, play hard, play smart, play together, have fun. Um, this is Coach uh, Prusak's basketball truisms, okay? The guy that taught the course. Um, and this is, this can build into a philosophy as well. There's only one way to play the game of basketball, hard. We give 100% and then some. My high school football coach used to say 110 miles per hour and go. Okay, um, kind of the same idea. Great players are made with great devotion and emotion. Okay, it's an emotional game. Um, though that emotion should be there. If that emotion isn't there, and your players seem to detach, uh, gotta do some introspection and see if we can get that emotion out of them. Okay, because they should feel deeply about this game. They should feel deeply about each play they make. They should be feel deeply and feel the pains of losing and winning. Um, uh, you do not have uh, to be. You do not have. It should be. You do not have to be fast. Fast to be quick. You just have to anticipate well. Okay. So quickness isn't about isn't about um, speed. speed. It's more about your awareness and anticipation and those kinds of skills, okay? Um, a good Talanoa Hufunga who just got hurt from the 49ers. He's one of the slower DBs, but he is an all pro because of the way he anticipates, okay? And the way that he sees in the game. Um, that can help with a lot of, a lot of uh, quickness. Okay, um, now these are the six challenges of coaching. All your success is dependent on the abilities of other people, right? Um, whether you win or lost, you have, you have control over it, but it's really, you're not in there performing, right? They are. Uh, coaches are evaluated by everyone. Um, everyone has a say on, on coaching, and, and it's a lot easier to coach from the sideline, right? Um, you have to, by the way, you have to know who to listen to with this, okay? Um, I think it, uh, some evaluation from others can be if those are trusted people and people that, that you really respect and that really know the game, um, that can be very helpful. However, um, not everyone knows the game. Um, and a lot of people will say things that really they have no idea about. <laughs> Everyone feels they have a knowledge about coaching sports. Uh, the highs are incredibly high. Again, emotional game. The highs are incredibly high and the lows are amazingly low. Oh man, how low that felt to lose to Hayden, right? And how low it felt for you guys to lose to North Valley Christian last year. Um, why we play the game though, right? The coach has a personal relationship with every player and has a dramatic impact on every player's life. What a statement right there. Um, 
that's one of the reasons why we coach too, right? To build those relationships and to realize that you have a dramatic impact, such a high impact on that individual's life. And um, a lot of players, that might be their most positive experience in their life at that time. And you can have a, a really big impact on the player's life. Success is based on the unusual paradox of getting an individual to work, to develop skills, and then getting him to sacrifice that for the well-being of the team. So there's a paradox there. You develop skills, but then sacrifice that for the, the well-being of the entire team. Not necessarily, like they're going to use those skills, but um, they might sacrifice some a shot or um, or a little bit of glory by doing the little things, right? Setting a screen, and, and those are things that you want to celebrate, right? The the things that uh, people don't necessarily see all the time, right? Oh man, that was an awesome screen you set. Um, way to get that rebound, way to do, way to dive for the ball. <clears throat> okay, two types of coaches. Um, I wanted to go over this uh, because I think it's extremely important in the way you approach coaching. Uh, indicators of an insecure coach. <clears throat> Just do what I tell you the way I tell you to do it, okay? Insecure coaches, just do it. Not really thinking about how to approach it a different way or maybe um, there's room for the coach to, to learn and grow. And you have to recognize that players are intelligent, okay? Um, one of the best ways to coach actually in a practice is give your players a problem. Give them a, a difficult problem and allow them to, to solve it. Um, allow player um, feedback and, and um, ask them how they feel about certain things or, or what's working for them and what's, what's not. Um, those are ways to improve as a coach. It's I am the coach. It's my way or the highway. Okay, same kind of principle, right? By the way, coaches should uh, listen to your assistant coaches, listen to player feedback, listen to people. Um, it's a collaborative effort. You don't need to know the reasons why, just do what you are told. <laughs> I mean, they should know the reasons why you do things. If we win, okay, this one's really a big pet peeve of mine. Um, if we win, it is because the players executed the game plan the coach came up with. If we lose, they did not skip to the game plan. Okay, and I've seen this actually play out where both ways, where a coach will be like, will take credit for a win and say, man, um, I did so so well at this and I game plan and basically praising themselves for the win. And then when they lose, they're like, oh, so, and they'll come at the players for losing. Um, I'm going to use Coach Justin again. Uh, last year, we got killed by Mogion. And um, we thought that we were going to be able to give them a game. We didn't. And as a coaching staff, uh, when we talked to the team afterwards, after being just embarrassed, is the most I've ever in any of my football playing experience, I've never allowed that many points to be scored on a team that I was a part of. 60 to 24. And um, as a coaching staff, uh, and Coach Justin was the one to lead it, he, he came up and said, I'm sorry, I did not do a, a good enough job to prepare you guys for this game. And I'm going to do better. And that's going to change. Um, and we uh, we would reference that game a lot over the last year, and it was definitely the number one game that was circled on our calendar. And we reminded our team of how painful that was at sixty twenty four. 
and use it as motivation and we we try to approach the game differently and help the players understand and, and do do things differently as a as a coach to prepare our team better. And it paid off this year, um, but that's the kind of mentality. Take if you win, it should be because the players did their job. Okay, credit to the players. Um, man, Ethan did an awesome job on defense. Man, um, Denim, do you see how he, he stuck it playing stuck to it playing both ways? He played on a, a sprained ankle. Man, Zed was had a bad bad back, but do you see how he executed the offense? Um, if we lose, man, that's on me as a coach. And uh, uh, players will respect you for that if you take that approach. Okay, uh, basically the same thing. There's a reason why we do it this way. Let me help you to understand why. The why is really important. We do what is good for kids first and easy for coaches last. Okay, the, the kids are forefront in our minds are um, their well-being. It is no longer about me, it is about the players. It's all about the players and their experience. I expect players to become students of the game and coaches become masters of the game. If we win, so again, uh, there's an expectation for players to become students, right? But there's also a higher expectation for the coaches right here. Take a little bit off of uh, the players because you're expected to become a master of the game. If we win, the players take the credit. If we lose, the coaches take the blame. Powerful statements right there. Okay. Um, why we do as important as what we do. Here's some examples of things that most basketball teams should do and why. I'm going to be talking about full court press in a, in a bit. Um, because there's a whole philosophy behind that and I've had some different experiences with that and um, I want us to uh, consider that. Okay, I'm going to skip through this. You guys can read this. Um, so what and, and what we're going to be doing, I'm going to give you an example. Um, I. I should have came more prepared and looked at multiple examples, but I pulled up one I was looking at the other day. Um, I think there's some good things they do and some not so good things. So uh, let's pull that up. Oh, I know why. Yeah, but they still went into their cross screen, which. Okay, so I'm going to. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. And then this uh, this packet is going to be something that I think would be really helpful to fill out. And especially, um, so it's going to be a little bit of homework. Um, when we meet about talking about, and I'll share, share this slide with you guys too. When we meet about talking about um, culture, um, I want you guys to have that philosophy right now and kind of edit it. Um, so here's an example of coaching philosophy, of a coaching philosophy. 
Um, in my coaching philosophy, the goal is to provide every student athlete with the opportunity to achieve academic and athletic success through a quality basketball program. So simple statements, okay? It's very, the words that you choose in this are going to be really careful, are really carefully chosen. Um, and you want to make it as simple and succinct as possible, but talk about the, your main beliefs. The basketball pro program coaches players will represent the school and the county in a positive image. I am picking my team. I will always choose the players that have these claw qualities. So these are some of the values that he has for basketball as a coach. Commitment, leadership, attitude, work ethic. Okay, and he has questions for each of them. And then I want the ideal player representing my program or school or county. Intelligent, dedicated, and he, use, he uses acronyms. You can choose to do that or not. And there's different ways, it doesn't have to be this format. Different ways you can write a coaching philosophy. But some of the things I like about this one is it's clear, there's values there, and, um, and I imagine that he would define what each of these means to him and his team, okay? Um, so when, when you guys, when you work on your packet, um, answer these questions. Why do I coach? What kind of experience do you want for your athletes? Okay, really think introspectively about this. What are your core values of coaching? Okay, so now this is kind of what he's going into. And I'm asking you to choose three to five core values you would like to build on. And rank them and write what each mean to you and, and your program. So for example, for football, we had five core values that we came up with. One for every day of the week that we would discuss every day. Monday was development, Tuesday respect, Wednesday integrity, Thursday unity, Friday competition. So those core values are really going to help drive your um, your coaching philosophy. And then uh, behind that, you can start drafting. You don't have to use this if you want to type it up and draft it that way, but it should be written, okay? And I actually would rec uh, recommend you guys to type it so that you have a file, okay, that you, is nice and neat. It should be written just like this, okay? Not exactly like this, but it should be written where you can, you can share it with your team and with everyone in your program and with potential interviewers in the future, okay? Um, all right, wow, 15 minutes. I'm gonna breeze through this quickly. <clears throat> okay, offensive philosophies, questions to consider, okay? How do I approach the three phases of offensive possession? Um, does ever, uh, I'm interested in coach, do you know what early offense is? Have you heard of it before? And right after a fast, fast break, how you set up in attack mode, but you're still setting up your play set? Uh, yeah, so it, early offense is a set that has a quick hitter, multiple options, um, that flows directly from fast break to um, to a quick hitter to and, and should end up back in your, your natural formation that can move directly into your offensive play sets in motion. Okay, uh, every team should have a couple of these early offenses. And you, uh, different ones for the different types of defenses you're going to see. Um, and they should be fluid, they should be quick. The reason why, we, I'll get into the reason why we do early offense. Um, in a second. Um, another question, what are the most important values to an offensive performance? Okay, this is going to be huge for your offensive philosophy. What are you going to focus on in, as an offense? Okay, and we'll get to that in a second. What are offensive, what offensive sets do you run against the different types of zone man, uh, the presses, what, what's going to be your press break, traps, etc., and why? How do you accomplish fluidity between transition early offense and all your offensive sets? And if we have time, I'll talk about this. Um, I have an example of 
how this can be accomplished. Um, okay, what are your most important values to your offense? Um, I think I have you choosing five. Yep. Um, choose five of your most important uh, values. So, points in the paint. Um, huge indicator of wins and losses. Who wins the, the battle in the paint? Um, if you want to emphasize points in the paint, you might want to have someone recording that statistic. How many points in the paint do they have versus us? And then at halftime, you review it and say, hey, we're, we're losing the points in the paint battle. We told ourselves we'd never lose the points in the paint. So how do we get more points and, and talk about and, and strategize how we're we going to get more points in the paint? Okay, how, are we going to drive? Are we going to be posting up? Uh, getting to the line. Now, what was interesting, uh, it was funny. Uh, last year, I went to the Canal game and um, we were playing with him in the first half. Um, and we were shooting the ball really well. Second half, we start, we, uh, our shooting started to go down and we, we stopped hitting as many shots. Um, and they were driving. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting watching two different styles of, of basketball. They're driving and one of the guys, you know, like every, everybody's a coach, right? One of the guys from the audience uh, was complaining. They looked up and they saw the foul difference. Um, we had like two team fouls, or we had, they had fouled us two, two times, and like we had fouled them like nine times or something like that. So there's this huge disparity. However, what they didn't understand is that we weren't playing the type of basketball to get to the Okay, because three shooting a lot of three pointers isn't going to get you a lot of foul shots. Yeah, we only had like two or three shots in the paint. Yeah, driving to the paint, that's where you're going to get fouled, right? Um, drawing fouls, things like that. So, um, which again, perimeter shooting could be your philosophy, um, but sometimes perimeter shooting and getting to the line don't always. Um, coincide right unless you're also driving and, and things like that so getting to the line uh, is if that's one of your uh, core philosophies which for some teams it is it's um, how are you going to accomplish that okay spacing is a huge one um, all good offenses have spacing um, if that's your philosophy you want to emphasize that over and over and over in your uh, in your practices. Controlling the pace, okay? Knowing when to speed the game up and to slow it down, okay? Being able to play different speeds of the game. Controlling the pace. Um, that might be a huge value for you. Ball movement, okay? Moving that ball from side to side, inside out. Uh, nobody holds on to that ball longer than this many seconds, okay? Moving without the ball. Um, Another in, huge indicator that we're going to talk about with offensive success, moving without the, the ball, everybody moving, taking care of the ball. So maybe your uh, a huge value is, I want to look at assists versus turnover uh, margin. And if these, if you guys can, um, the mo more you can uh, measure these, the better they are. You, you can be like, hey. We had this many assists versus this many turnovers. We need to get that number up higher. Or, um, hey, I, I saw you and uh, during the game, we only had two people moving without the ball. Uh, offensive rebounding. Okay, how many offensive rebounding are you getting? Is that a, a value? Perimeter shooting, posting up. How many times are we posting up and hitting our post win and getting post up points? Driving to the paint. How many times are we doing that? Effective screens, ball screens, and off ball screens. Okay, so these uh, you want to choose what values, and there's there can be others, but I'll put some of the uh, basic ones. 
there can be other, uh, you want to choose which values are the most important, and those really want to be emphasized. Okay? Um, we're going to break these down each individually quickly. Transition offense, I did this with uh, the coaching, coaches clinic. Really, we want these, this is too narrow. We want them to get wider, but this needs to be organized. And uh, for, this is, uh, most teams run this transition offense, most effective teams. Um, notice the four always takes that ball out every single time, okay? No exceptions so that everybody else can get in the break. Uh, should, you should get, um, there's a statement we're going to be reading in a second that talks about how uh, teams that are able to move the, push the ball into the front court within three to five seconds and get early shots are typically the hardest teams to guard. Um, easiest points to score in all of basketball are, are transition points. The more time it takes to score, it becomes significantly harder to get a good shot. That's because the defense becomes more and more organized, typically the longer the, um, the possession goes. And you got to be more patient and you got to uh, look for good shots the longer it takes. Uh, transition offense. Transition points often dictate the winners of basketball games. So another, uh, another, uh, value of yours might be transition points. Are we winning the transition battle? Um, transition offense requires high pace, quick decision making. Because of that, it needs to be practiced every day. If it's not, you're not going to get good at this. So I did this with the boys the other day, and um, it, was one of, it was one of their first practices of the season. And to be expected, um, they didn't run lanes very well, they didn't make decisions very well, and it looked like a mess, okay? That's okay. Again, they're intelligent, the more you work at it, the more they're going to be able to figure it out. So that's why you work on it every day. And the more they get to playing and the more reps they get, the better they're going to get at it. Um, lane running is essential to highly organized it allows for spacing and allows for plays to be made. So make sure that they're lane running. Um, speed zone, right here. If they're not speed zone right here after a missed shot or a made basket, when we get that transition basket, that means they're too tired to be out there. So if I see a player um, jogging or not giving it, if they're all in the speed zone and not getting to the front court, um, then I'm going to sub them out because uh, either they're they're not giving me their all or they're too tired and they need a blow. Okay, um, and that means that maybe they need a little bit more conditioning um, and more practice at at this during practices. Head man the ball, eyes up. Don't just put the ball on the floor. You get it. You grip. You turn and you look. And if you can pass it to someone open, you pass it to them. That's what head man the ball means. Um, again, four takes the ball out every time. One calls for the ball. Right here, they have one way up high. Um, if they can get that ball right there, fine. Uh, we would practice free throw line extended. So that one gets that ball to its dominant side, calls outlet, outlet, and they're off. Um, notice he's not coming back to the ball unless he absolutely has to, unless this guy gets in trouble and he sees he has to come back, then that's the only time. Um, okay, why the need for early offense? We're not gonna have enough time to go through all of these. Um, we might do a, might have to pick this back up and, uh, sometime next week. Why the need for an early offense? The main reason for early offense accompanied by flow action is to force the defense to react rather than act. This simply put is to advance the ball quickly into the front court areas and attack before the defense is able to become organized into a disruptive force. 
as defensive specialists over many years of coaching, um, I can't remember where I found this, but I found this somewhere. We have found the most difficult teams to defend were the ones with offenses that push the ball into the front court hash mark areas in a time span of three to five seconds. So again, transition offense is so important there. Even if you don't get a transition point, it's going to put a lot of stress on the defense, and they're going to be disorganized when they first get back there. Because they have to stop the ball, right? And there's going to be mismatches. There's going to be opportunities for, for points. This early offense push creates quick, medium jump shots or penetration layups or kick out passes for scores to occur before the defense has had a chance to set up and disrupt any organized set play. We have also found that when teams walk the ball up the court, they were much easier to defend because the defense was able to get its players back into positions near the basket where they can execute pressure denials, traps to disrupt the offensive flow and to force rush shots as time on the clock became a factor. So as you can see, I'm really for transition and high pace and controlling and dictating tempo. However, um, if you feel like your team has absolutely no shot and you have a lot of uh, players that are a lot less, which we have athletes that are capable, yeah. so that's not our team. But if you have athletes that are really bad and not capable, uh, another strategy might be to slow the game down because if you slow down possessions, in that case, usually it gives the advantage to the worst team. However, we have a really good team um, and almost, I think all of our teams are, are pretty good. They have, we have capable athletes. So if you have higher possessions and higher pace, you're going to give your team more opportunities to score. And generally that benefits the, um, the better team. So that's something to keep, um, keep in mind as well. Early offense. Quick hitters, off ball screening and movement. These are all things that you want to look at with early offense. Should end up with players spaced out in the four and out, which is the transition uh, offense um, in that formation or in another formation that leads directly to a play set or motion. And I'm going to show you a, an example as we end today. Um, really quick, offensive plays and sets and motions. Um, this is the final 15 to 20 seconds of the shot clock. Uh, we don't have a shot clock in Arizona, but one's coming. Um, this is where you need to be really organized and you're going to be have, have to be more methodical about how you are attacking a defense. Here's some keys to any good offensive play set in motion. You, um, as coaches, you guys should look online for examples, for the best examples. Look at how colleges attack different um, zones and so forth. Um, this is huge. At least three players should always be moving at any given time. Um, now, as I've watched some of our film, um, I look at this, and a lot of times this isn't the case. So there's a lot of players just standing and looking at the ball, and that's a lot of time when the offense becomes stagnant. Um, so you want players moving. You want multiple players moving in and out of spaces as much as possible. Read the defense, attack its weaknesses. Certain defenses have certain weaknesses. So you want to design, or you want to put players in, in spaces that will attack those, those weaknesses. You should have a few plays that are designed to attack man, a few plays designed to attack an even front zone, a few plays to attack an odd front zone. Um, you should also have multiple ways to break a press and those should be practiced right away. Um, and all of these uh, offensive plays, sets and motions should give your players many options to attack and score. Uh, this is a time to be patient. You need, don't need to rush shots at this point. Be patient, look for specific shots, look for specific ways to beat um, the defense. Uh, this next to the last principle is really important too. Players should have options. Again, players are smart. Give them options to be able to attack. 
The other reason is sometimes defenses will take something away, and if there's only one option and they take it out of the way, then you guys are screwed, right? So different options whenever a player has the ball to attack and score. Um, okay, this is just some principles for beating a help side man. Some uh, principles for attacking different zones and some of their weaknesses. Um, I'll go over more detail the next time since we're out of time. Um, I just wanted to end with some fluidity. Okay, so offensive, the three offensive phases, transition. We're running our lanes, okay? We're going to end up with the one right here, the four trailing, the, I, I got the three and the two mixed up, but the three's on this side, the two's on this side, the five's going down the middle. Three's on the left, is what it means. Yeah, the, well, the two's on the right. Yeah, I, I had the one on the left. Yeah. yeah. Which, these two can be interchangeable. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so here would be an example of an early offense. So you can see they're already in their lanes right here. And now uh, we're going to pass the ball here. Uh, the one's going to cut, five's going to flash, looking for a post up right there. If the post up's not there, um, two, look, look at the options. You could pass, you can dribble, drive to the paint. Um, we also have a, a guy flashing over here that you can pass to. Uh, when the ball's up here, the two, uh, there's uh, a stagger screen, the two's coming off, uh, three can pass it to that stagger screen, there can be a curl or a, a, a flare, um, and then the five's gonna set a screen for the one coming back. So we can pass it here, here, lots of options. Um, and you go through this progression, it doesn't take very long, and look where everybody ends up. We have four out and one in, okay? And you can run straight off of that, you can run the flex. Um, do you know the flex offense? If you have a, a, a team that plays man, this is a, an extremely effective offense. And it's really easy to learn. Look, it's five steps and it starts over. So here's a flex motion. And um, I can uh, come by and, and help you guys run this if you guys want me to. We'll just have to pick a time that works for both of us. But um, really effective offense against the man. And it's all about, here's a flex screen. Uh, we have a cutter coming right here. This, I used to love running this offense. This guy is all, uh, this guy eventually usually gets open for a layup. And you're scoring wide open layups right here. Easy buckets. You can also have the five seal after that and, and there might be um, an option there. Um, after, if it's not there, um, one pass to the two. yeah, the one's going to pass to the two and the two's going to look there. Once the one passes, the one comes and screens down, the five pops up. And this shot is often open as well. Yeah. So, and then you see the one goes out, creating space for uh, this next player to replace it. It's a really effective, uh, Valley Christian, you know Valley Christian? Yeah. Division three. They've won um, how many state ch championships in a row? Like three, right? I think it's three, yeah. Uh, Powerhouse, they run this a lot. They run flex motion a lot. So this is a very effective offense. And I'll share this to you, with you guys if you guys want to look at, that, look at it. Again, this is designed for man. So not going to be as effective against a 2-3 where you have a big man sitting right there. Um, but if it's a man and uh, they got to get through, fight through off-ball screens, a ton of off-ball screens, this is really effective. Okay, that's where we're going to end today. Um, might have to pick this up next week. Uh, for now, and I'll get these packets to the other coaches. Uh, Coach Fano, uh, what you can do is start by answering these questions that will help you guide your uh, coaching philosophy. Look at coach, uh, coach examples of coaching philosophy that you see online. 
draft your own, and then you can start to draft your own offensive philosophy as well um, by answering some of those questions and working through the workshop. Um, I'm just going to end before I let you go. This is what we came up with in football. Um, we had an offensive philosophy and defensive philosophy, um, air raid principles. That was our philosophy. We wanted to do air raid, be in sync. The timing was extremely important. We practiced the timing a lot. Um, positive, we focused on positive plays. Okay, uh, Win the turnover battle, dictate tempo, dominate the line, line of scrimmage. For defense, communication. Um, and this is a list of values. Um, um, we we want to flesh it out a little bit more and, and talk about which what these mean to us. Uh, shrink the field, limit space, setting the edge, do your job, trust each other. So that's an example of our football philosophy. Um, here's an example of offensive and defensive philosophy. Again, anagrams. Um, very simple, outrun defense, high for position, follow shot. These are some of their values. Um, it could be very simple and short like this, or it could be fleshed out a little bit more, where you talk about your stages and why you do what you do. And what are your most important values should be in there. Okay? Uh, thanks for showing up. And, um, I'm excited to see where you take the bills this year. <clears throat> okay, um, I didn't have the opportunity to go through the defensive side of the philosophy, so I wanted to do that today. And um, real quick, something that I wanted to mention, so the difference between a coaching philosophy and an offensive and defensive philosophy is this. A coaching philosophy is basically like, your values that you want to install as a coach. What's important to you? Um, kind of what we talked about in the other video. Um, when you get into your offensive and defensive philosophies, um, you know, every offense, uh, their goal is to score, right? And every de defense, their goal is to stop the other team from scoring. Um, but... Uh, where you get into the philosophy is the how. The how and why of stopping someone from scoring. So um, instead of just telling your team to, hey, stop them from scoring, it's a lot more powerful if you give them a philosophy of how you're going to accomplish that as an individual and then as a team. So... That's kind of what you want to think about with your uh, offensive and defensive philosophies, okay? How you're going to score as a team, how you're going to keep the other team from scoring as a team. And um, there's uh, certain principles that your entire team should know. Like if you go up and ask your team, uh, what's your defensive philosophy, then um, they should be able to spit back at you um, the how your team is collectively going to score, okay? We're going to keep them out of the middle, okay? No middle, no middle, no middle. We're going to force them to the baseline. Um, and then we're going to deny reversal, okay? So uh, um, those are, are some things that they might spit back at you with your defensive philosophy. Um, before we get into the defensive philosophy, um, I was just going to um, go over um, offense, just touch on uh, attacking a zone. We didn't really talk about that. Um, and this slide right here has the different advantages and disadvantages of some of the zone defenses we have. Um, so... When you're attacking uh, a zone, you, you need to realize that the zone is set up in a certain way. And there's a certain, you want to 
how you want to attack it is you want to put uh, your players in the natural gaps or the natural um, the uh, the the places in between uh, their zones. Okay, the spaces. So, for example, in a two-three, you have a two-high, right? You have two guards up high on their defense. So you're going to um, put opposite. You're going to put three high. Um, you're going to have your point guard in the middle, um, and then you're going to have your two wings, so that you have people in those natural gaps. And then um, you can have a high-low game going on with your four and your five, um, where your five is flashing up to the high post, your fours in the dunker's position, um, and then you're looking for those high lows or that um, that elbow shot or cutters or looking to reverse it with that um, high post. And then your, um, your guard should always be moving in this, like passing and cutting away and passing and cutting away. And really quickly, in any zone, your... Um, the emphasis should be on a couple of things. First, uh, you don't want to dribble. You don't want to waste any dribbles when you're playing in a zone. Um, all of your dribbles should be, the only time you should dribble, it should be um, attacking the paint, okay, driving to the paint. Um, that's the only time you should ever be dribbling. Uh, other than that, it's, it's too slow. You want to get that ball moving. So, um, and you want your players to all be moving. Um, so you pass and, and cut and uh, cut away and then replace and then r r rotate the ball. And you want that zone to start to get off balance. <clears throat> and then that's when you, when you see those creases, uh, you want to start attacking the paint driving to the paint, looking for kicks, uh, dishes, <clears throat> looking to finish. Um, and again, with any offense, I cannot stress this in enough. In any offense you run, you want no less than three people moving at a time. Okay, the more movement you can get, um, the more that zone's going to start to break down, okay, and start to get confused. And you got to be a little bit patient attacking in the zone sometimes. Okay. Um, we'll come back to some of these zones as we talk about defense. Um, but um, here's some philosophies, some uh, questions to consider about defensive philosophy. Okay. First, what is your team's base defense and why? I highly suggest that whatever your guys' base defense is, uh, that's what you want to practice the majority of time in practice. Um, and in games, this should be probably your, your defense, your base defense should be what you run 95 to 98 or 99% of the time. So um, almost it, it's, what, it's what you go to. The reason why is because you only have so much time and if you have a, a bunch of different defenses that you have to practice, um, it takes away from getting better at your base. And it's always my belief that you should be, um, it's better to be really good at what you do and have an identity at what you do than to be mediocre at best at a lot of things. Um, we did this in football. In football, I came into the season wanting to run a couple different defenses, but I ended up abandoning all the, the other defenses because we needed to get really good at, at the defense that we were running. And um, we, we really focused on that defense, and we got really good. Now, um, I want to talk about how if if man is your base defense it kind of helps to do this because a lot of the players are 
have been playing zone forever especially here in Colorado City and it's it's really easy to tell them to go out there and, and run a 2-3 zone because um, they don't need a ton of practice to do that they have been doing it their whole lives they know what it is um, and if you're running man defense it, and I'll explain this later it should help with that but that's those are choices that are going to be up to you okay what your team bait base defense is going to be and why okay um and then second question what will be your two most utilized backup defenses and why and again these defenses you might want to use for different tactical reasons depending on who you're playing or depending on how much if you want to disrupt the flow of the game and things like that but um again these backup defenses i don't suggest um, taking a ton of time away from your base defense because that's that base defense really needs to be your identity. Uh, th three, when do you decide to press or trap? Um, I'm going to talk about um, the psychology um, and the mentality of a press in a, in a little bit. Um, but there's different reasons why you might want to do it and why you might not um i'm i have my own biases and i'll talk about that about press and trap but it's something that you're going to have to decide as a coach for which well with each defense how will your team work together to stop the offense okay so this is these last two questions are really going to get into how you develop your defensive philosophy how are you going to stop the the offense okay and these questions are going to help with that where do you not want the ball to go okay in the coaching clinic i talked about no middle no middle no middle okay that's my defensive philosophy right i don't want that ball going to the middle because i know that when that ball is, is when when teams drive the ball in the middle usually good things happen for the offense right there's a lot of options you get everyone's eyes there you get back doors you get a lot of easy points. That's, if you're an offense, you want that ball going in the paint. If you're a defense, you don't. At least part of, that's my philosophy, right? And also, um, I want that ball going into my extra defenders, natural defenders on the court, which are the sideline and the baseline. Okay, as much help as you can get. So my philosophy is no middle, I don't want that ball going in the middle. That's why I told the players to say no middle, no middle, no middle. And you force that ball to the sideline and the baseline. Um, what do you want to take away? So again, defense, you can never take away everything, okay? But you can take away something. So again, if you take away middle, you know they have to go baseline. So... so uh, it helps as an individual defensive player to take something away. But when you get to a team defense and you're collectively uh, working to push the ball in certain areas of the court, um, then that's when defenses get really special and really disruptive and, uh, and really dominant. So uh, working together as a team to push the ball in certain ways and then you can spring traps that way right we can we can trap we can literally trap or we can we can set up where we deny the reverse or something like that or we can set up places where we're going to likely get a lot of charges and, and things like that and then finally number five what are the most important defensive values you want your team to focus on so we're going to talk about, um, we're going to list a couple of these values. Again, this is going to be really important um, when you are developing your own philosophy. Um, so these values are going to be something that you might want to think about putting in your philosophy. Actually, I'd highly encourage you to. And I'm going to go over a couple of values that you might put on your defensive philosophy. Um, I think I, I, I asked you in your packet to choose five. 
Um, but, and there might be some on this list that you don't have, um, that aren't on this, that you have that aren't on this list, which is okay. Here's just a couple that I have, okay? Uh, values, deflections. Um, by the way, d that defender, Darren Collison, one of the, the best defenders on UCLA when they made their uh, final four runs. They made three straight final four runs. I'm a big UCLA fan, and he was probably the team's best on-ball defender. Um, the coach really uh, emphasized defense. Um, the current UCLA coach, Mick Cronin, one of the things he really emphasizes, emphasizes defense as well. And um, one of the measures that he has is deflections. So he wants active hands. He wants hands in the passing lanes because um, he knows that if he gets so many deflections, that's going to lead to stills. That's going to lead to transition bet buckets, which is going to lead to easy buckets, which is going to lead to more points. So he's really big on deflections, and he will have a statistician uh, um, keep track of during the game how many defect deflections his team has, and um, he'll he'll ask um, throughout the game how how many deflections he's getting at halftime. He'll look and they'll talk about it, and then um, if you if you've ever seen a press conference with Mick Cronin, he'll talk about how many deflections. Like he knows the number by number at the end of the game. We had this many deflections. So um, your value, um, I want you to choose five of these values that are most important to you and rank them and talk about why these values are important to you. And this is going to kind of shape your defensive philosophy. Um, maybe moving your feet is a value, right? Um, how, how quickly are we moving our feet? Are we getting, are we... Uh, are we cutting off driving lanes? Um, eye on the ball, right? Um, are we uh, looking at the ball carrier instead of just focusing on our man, right? So we're not losing track of the ball. Um, defensive rebounding, okay? Huge indi indicator of success. If you can limit a team to one shot per possession, that's huge. So maybe that's a big thing for you. Communication. This is definitely one of mine. Um, you, I believe you can't play defense. Or you can't play the game, but especially not defense without communication. Talk about what you're doing. Talk to your teammates, okay? Call out screens, okay? Um, call out your positions. Um, <clears throat> call out shot. Call out box, right? Um, it's something that I stress with my football team, too. Um, when I first got here, nobody was communicating and something that Coach Justin and I really stress with our football team so that um, now when they, um, when they play, they're, they're naturally calling out formations that they see. They're naturally talking to each other a lot more. Okay? And at times, we, we still have to stress, hey, we're not communicating, so let's get louder. Let's communicate. Hustle plays. Oh, I love hustle plays. These are the winning plays, right? Um, the little plays that n not a lot of people see, but these are are the plays that win games. Um, <clears throat> how many players are you? Uh, how many uh, players are diving for loose balls on the floor? How many players are taking stepping in, and taking charges? How many players are are going after that ball for rebounds? How many players are uh, <clears throat> getting back on defense? Um, are uh, hustling in, tr in the transition game. So hustle plays. Charges, again, um, one of the biggest things that you can do. And these hustle plays, is, plays and charges, if, if that's your emphasis, um, one of your, the things that you guys want to, your values that you want to emphasize in your program, um, you want to celebrate those, okay? Build players up when they do these things recognize them okay um my brother when he played college basketball um he said that one of the things that his coaches would do is at the end of the game 
Um, you know how they give game balls out and stuff like that. Well, they would do. Uh, they would. He would throw out a marker for uh, a a player on the team that took the most charges, and they got to go and and x out the team that they just played. Um, and it'd be something that would be really celebrated. And um, so maybe you have a goal. We want to get this many charges per game. And you have a goal of like, okay, who's going to be our leader in charges? And you keep track of those things. And maybe you have like a, a board that's hung up in the weight room or the basketball gym or something like that that shows um, how many of these hustle plays or how many of these charges you're, you're seeing from each player. And, and that competition could really be a positive force too. Uh, closeouts, okay. Every every um, good defense, you need to be able to close out really well. So um, maybe that's your emphasis. We're going to emphasize closeouts, accountability. Um, again, my brother said this sucked um, when he played college basketball. Sometimes, especially when um, he got torched, but. His coach would always at halftime, he'd write on the whiteboard all the, the names of the players that played, and he'd write how many points were scored on them. And, um, and then after the game, um, they would have to watch film on each basket that they were scored on, and they'd have to explain what they did wrong and how they, can, um, how they could have prevented those points to be scored on them. So accountability is huge, especially, and this is one of the benefits to man defense, right? Because it's easier to be accountable when you're playing help side man. But um, if, if someone uh, scores on you, okay, you, you're accountable for that, okay? You got to take ownership of that. Um, so maybe that's something you stress. Contested shots, right? Get, get a hand up in every shot. No open shots. Don't allow any open shots. Maybe that's an emphasis, emphasis of yours. And then points on the paint, uh, kind of like we, what we talked about on offense. Maybe that's a measure for defense too. How many points are you preventing from the paint? Okay. Um, are you clogging up the paint? Are you clogging up those driving lanes? And that can be a huge indication of success as well. Um, so these are some of the values. Again, pick pick uh, five, your top five that you really want to emphasize on your team. And these are things that you want to talk about, right? You want to talk about over and over and over again in practices and games, okay? Um, they're your focus. They're things that you want to celebrate when you see your players do. And, and that really helps narrow the focus and helps the team um, – helps the team perform better in the way you want them to perform. Okay. Um, again, what is your team's base defense and why? Here's um, There's strengths and weaknesses to every defense. Um, I'm going to talk about help side man. I'm going to buoy it up a little bit for you um, and some of the reasons why, uh, in my philosophy, that's always my base defense. Um but there's other uh, defenses that can be effective at times. For example, help side man, for it to work, it needs to actually be help side, right? You're not just covering your man, um, a, a straight man defense where you're, you're chasing a guy all around the court, right? Help side man means if your man is farther from the ball, you're in the driving lanes ready to help. Um, and the... Uh, Bill Self, um, one of the truisms of his defense is uh, he says, the farther away your man is from the ball, the more you can help. Okay? The farther away your man is from the ball, the more you're able to help. Um, that means that if the ball is on the other side of the court, why, why be all the way on your man covering him? And leaving the the driving lanes wide open, what you would much better serve as a help if you you have a foot in the paint ready to help out and step out, than to be all the way out on your man. Um, 
and you need to have and you you need to see the ball and see what's going on and then see your man in your peripheral right because the ball the the person with the ball is the most immediate threat to score a basket and if that ball's past your your man and it's from the other side of the court you should have time to uh you should have time to close out and get there if you're moving as the ball moves so that's that's the basic principle to help side man. Uh, two three zone. Um, again, if if you have um, if if the other team's really good in, inside the post, you might want to consider this. Okay, the weak the biggest weaknesses of two three zone is a perimeter shooting. It's not a very good defense to stop perimeter shooting, um, and as well zone defenses generally um if you get enough ball movement and if a team really knows how to attack a zone then they're really um hard to it it, the defense uh becomes a lot more ineffective a three two zone kind of the opposite of a two three uh two three is more uh is better at uh defending the perimeter shooting but the inside, especially the high post and cutters and, and things like that, is much more vulnerable. Um, when I took uh, my coaching basketball class in college, um, I learned an, another zone that I wish that I would have been able to play as a, a, as a player. It's a 2 3 3 2 hybrid. It's, it's a really cool zone. Um, it basically changes from a 3-2 to a 2-3 depending on the level of the ball. So it kind of eliminates a lot of the weaknesses of both both those zones. Um, if you guys are interested in learning this 2-3-3-2 uh, three, three, hybrid, um, I'd be happy to show you how it works. Again, it's your choice, especially this late in the season, if you'd want to implement that. But just uh, contact me and say, hey, coach, can you... Uh, Come show us uh, how that works, and I can uh, I can show you how that works. It's really simple, really easy to learn, um, and it's uh, I believe it's more effective than just a, a two three or a three two on its own. Um, you have the one three one zone that is uh, usually really exhausting, high energy. Um, a lot of teams like to trap out of the one three one zone. So uh, usually, when I use the one three one three one zone, uh, when I was a player, um, it was uh, usually about like two or three possessions, and then we get back to our, our base defense because it's so demanding. However, um, I, I used to love the spurts that we used to play it because it throw the defense off or the offense off usually um and we can we can get some traps and some quick turnovers um but the the problem with the one three one zone is i used to love playing against it because it's so easy to figure out uh, especially after a couple possessions and it's uh i used to it used to be an easy zone for us to score on so they a one three one in my experience usually loses its effectiveness after a couple of possessions, but if you use it for a couple of possessions and you get back to your base and then get back to it, it can be highly effective. Um, a half court trap and full court press. We're going to talk later about that. Okay, um, but you might I, I would if I as a coach I would have a. Uh, at least one half court press and at least one full court press that I can run. Um, okay. Reasons to consider help side man is your base. Again, this is my bias. Um, but it's also, I'm not alone in how I view this. If you look at uh, most college and NBA teams, um, almost everyone is playing a help side man defense. The, the top teams in high school if you look at uh one or five or six a teams five a teams four a teams the top teams are all playing help side man the top teams in 1a are are mostly playing 
help side man. And there's a reason for that. Um, most people view it as a superior defense. Here's why. Um, you get better ball pressure. Uh, in 1A, many players don't, don't do well under ball pressure. I've seen it. Um, let's be frank. Not the best athletes in 1A. There's some good athletes, but not the best athletes and and um and you just don't have the same player development that you might have in a 6a school so it might be a good idea to always have pressure on the ball um you can match up your best defender this is huge your best defender on the po opponent's best offensive player um i when i played um, in high school, I was our team's best defender, so I took a lot of pride in this. So our coach would always uh, match me up with the uh, the opposing uh, players, the opposing team's best player. Um, a lot of these players were Division One players, and um, and he would tell me my, that my number one job was to shut that player down. So it's something that I took a lot of pride in. Um, now uh, that's one of the big benefits of of help of help side man is you get to match up who is guarding who. Um, when you sub people in, you say, "I want you guarding this person." So, um, and you can put your your typically your worst defenders on their uh, their their smallest threats offensively. Um, you get increased in accountability on defense. We kind of talked talked about that, right? In zone, and I saw this last year um, on on some of the teams, uh, there'd be players that let someone get a line drive to the basket, and there's no accountability for the for that happening because um, Ethan would just step in and like try to block a shot, right? Um, or or someone else, and it's a lot harder to hide that when you're playing man defense. Um, it's a lot easier to to get that accountability. You can still get it in zone defenses, but it's a lot harder. You usually get higher um, intensity on defense. Number five, um, it number six, help side man defense it is usually easier to execute team philosophy. Right, it's it's easier to say, hey, we want to push this ball this way. You can still do it in zone. I just think it's a little bit easier to do it in help side man. Number seven, more charges usually, right? Uh, because you have players helping in and stepping into driving lanes. Um, it's easier to rebound because you have people to mark. Um, even in a two three defense, when you have tall guys right in the middle. Um, you don't have <clears throat> always uh, this communication in a zone where you can easily mark crashing uh, offensive rebounders. But in help side man, you have a man, right? You're responsible for your man. So you know if that guy gets if that guy gets an offensive rebound, it's on you. right? So it's easier to, to mark up and rebound in a help side man defense. It's uh, now this one again is kind of counterintuitive because uh, a lot of people think man is so much more demanding. It's actually not, and the reason why is because if you're doing a true help side man, um, again, if you're if the ball is away from you, you're not moving all over the court chasing someone, right? You're moving in strategic places in 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 those driving lanes. Um, so it, you're actually conserving more energy than in, in some other types of defenses. Um, <clears throat> to, to run a, a zone really well, it actually takes a lot of, a lot of energy. Um, number 10, it will teach your players to become better defenders. Now, I wish we did this, but in uh, Europe, in a lot of places, they actually don't teach zone defense defensive schemes until the players are much older because their whole philosophy is we're going to teach them how to play defense first. Once they know how to play defense, then they can, 
then they can play zone. Uh, they can learn how to play zone. Uh, and I wish we did it here because if you watch uh, in Colorado City, our youth leagues, uh, they, everyone plays zone. And nobody's really learning how to play defense. Um, they're just learning how to, how to occupy certain spaces. And if you play man, you have to learn how to be, become a defender or else you're going to get torched. So, um, so that's one of the benefits of man as well. And 11 kind of goes with it. You can't get really good at his own for the reasons I just explained. Unless you know how, unless you know help side man concepts really well. So again, back to what I talked about earlier, is if your base is help side man, it's actually you don't have to spend as much time on defense because if you get really good at help side man, then the players already kind of know zone, right? You might want to spend a little bit of time, but we never really spent um, when I played high school a lot of time doing our different zones because we already knew zone. Um, so if in a game time situation, like let's say they're hitting threes on us and we want to um, we want to stop the three point shot, so we're like, okay, we're going to go into three two. We all knew that. We all knew how to do that. So it, it's something that we didn't really have to practice to be effective at. However, if you don't practice help side man, um, then you can't really do it well if you don't practice that in your practices. So if, on the flip side, if, if your base is a, a zone and then you want to switch to help side man, it's a lot harder to be effective at that if you're not practicing it. So... <clears throat> Um, that's why, um, personally, I would uh, consider help side man as your base. Um, now, this is going to have to be your decision. It's your team. Um, so you're going to have to make that decision, but make sure that you know the reasons why you're making that decision. And if the reason why is you don't know how to implement help side man, um, then, again, you can ask. You can ask for resources, right? You can ha ask me to help uh, come in and, and help you implement that. Um, there's places that you can go to obtain that knowledge, um, but you need to make those decisions for your own team. Okay, um, I want to talk about your the team psychology of a press. Now I had uh, I've I've ran pretty much every type of defense um, and every t type of trap that is out there in my playing experience, um, and I've had some different uh, coaches that had different um, philosophies of press. Uh, one of my coaches, it was a really um, focused part of his philosophy he would talk about it is we would press on made baskets every made basket we'd press i had another coach um that the only time he would press ever was if we we're down by like 15 to 20 points and we needed to make a comeback and he usually only pressed Sometimes he'd press in like the second quarter, but usually it was like the end of the third, start of the fourth quarter, or late in the fourth quarter that he would press. Kind of desperation mode. Um, now I want you to think about the psychology of, of these two different philosophies. Um, let's take the first example. My coach who... It was part of our philosophy and we're, is part of our DNA is who we were. We were going to press on made baskets. So we're pressing throughout the game multiple times a game. The um, reason why we did that is we just made a basket, right? Now, how are we feeling about ourselves if we just made a basket? Feeling pretty good, right? Um, we're, we're high. Their energy is high. Our excitement is high, and now we're going to press. How much, how effective do you think that press was? Probably a pretty good, pretty effective press, right? 
uh, because our energy is high. We're in a good place uh, emotionally, right? Um, now think about the uh, if if you just got scored on, and now you're taking the ball out, and oh man, they're already up in your face. You're already feeling down because you just got scored on, and now they're up in your face trying to get that ball back again, putting pressure on you. Now a, a lot of teams panic in the, in those in that situation, and it's a psychological game that you're playing. Only the the toughest teams can, um, um, or or if they're just way more skilled, they can overcome that, right? Um, but that psychology of pressing after made baskets, it's our DNA. It's not only who we are, so we're going to take pride in it, but we're we're pressing off of made baskets. Um, my other coach. Now think about the psychology of this. Um, you're down. You're not feeling very good because you're down. You're already getting panicked because the cl- you, you can feel the clock ticking down. And you're down 15, 20 points. And you're trying to make a comeback. Your press is going to be a lot less effective. It's going to be a lot more desperate and a lot more panicked. And um, you're more likely to give up big plays in that situation. Um, and the other team, um, they're thinking, they're feeling pretty good about themselves because they have a, a good cushion and they're kind of expecting you to press at this point because you're getting desperate. So the different psychology of that um, is, is huge when you're playing basketball. Um, so... Of course, my um, my philosophy is I love to press, especially in 1A uh, where you see teams can't handle pressure very well. And if you're practicing this press, you're not only helping your team be able to handle pressure type situations, but you're getting better at this press and, and you're going to be able to affect Almost every 1A team, even the best 1A teams, North Valley Christian, they don't really handle pressure that well. Um, I've seen it. Um, So um, that's my big thing is I'm a big press guy. Um, So if you guys uh, want uh, help in implementing a press, I would highly suggest that you have a press. Um, you need one um, because you're at some point in the season you're going to need to run it. And if the very first time you're running a press is in a game that you need to uh, uh, you need it, then it's too late. You need to be practicing this. Um, but if you'd like help in implementing this and talking about this psychology uh, and the mentality of it and the um, and um, the X's and O's of a press. There's different types of presses. Like you have the diamond press, the two two one, the one two one two. Um, I can help you out with that if if you want. Just give uh, just let me know. Um, let me tell you this as well. I've never had more fun uh, playing in a game or a season than that year that we did this where we pressed after made baskets. Our team went undefeated, and we just had a blast. It was high pace, um, high energy. Um, A lot of people got a chance to play because we were blowing teams out, and we were um, having fun doing it. And also, it's high energy, so you get a chance to rotate players a lot. Um, And uh, we would go on these incredible runs. We'd go on, like... 30 to 4 runs, 20, 25 to 2. We'd just go on these huge runs because we'd score and then boom, we get the team to panic, cause a quick turnover, quick point, and then we're back at it. And it's, it's so much fun. Um, now, these are the goals of presses. The number one goal of a press is causing the other team to panic. If you can cause the other team to panic, you've won already. Because they're going to create mistakes. And they're going to give you easy buckets. Um, And other reasons why you might want to press is to speed the other team up. 
So if you guys run, like if you guys just try this, and you guys probably have already seen this, if you throw a press at our team, and I saw this last year, you throw a press out at the team, man, they get so sped up. Um, and part of breaking the press too is is teaching the the players to not try to dribble out of the press, teaching them to pass and to flash middle and to to run lanes and, and stuff like that and and not try to try to overcome the tendency, the natural tendency to rush when you, whenever you're getting pressed. You you kind of want to slow it down in your mind. And of course if there's an easy bucket, take it. But if there's not, man, slow that slow that ball down. Um, kind of slow the game down in your mind whenever you're, you're you're up against a press. But the goal of a press is to speed other teams up, try to get them to shoot quickly, uh, get quick turnovers and easy transition points, and then cause the game to have more possessions. So again, if you um, if you feel like you're a better a uh, team, you might want to have more possessions because the more possessions in a game, typically it um, it benefits the better team. Or if you're late in a game and uh, and you're down by like 10 or so and you need more possessions and you're late in a game, you might want to press because it's likely to cause the game to have more possessions. Okay? Um... I had this slide to show some of the presses, but if you guys want um, me to show you, um, we, I can show you when I meet with you, or if you want me to come to one of your practices. All right, um, and then finally, we're going to get back to the team philosophy. How will your team work together to stop the offense? Okay, it should be one of these three. Are you going to force baseline, force help, or force weekend? Okay. Again, my philosophy, I'm huge on forcing baseline, okay? Um, because why force help when you have natural extra defenders on the sideline and the baseline? Also, again, in the middle of the paint is where bad things tend to happen, from my experience, on a defensive perspective. Okay, but you're going to have to choose which one of these you want to do. And that should be written... In your uh, when you draft your philosophy, um, that this is who we are. This is our DNA. This is how we're going to stop the defense. And again, here are some of the important values to your defenses. Um, again, choose five of these, and you want to uh, explain why. And these these values should be in your philosophy as well. So again, just like. Uh, uh, creating your coaching philosophy and your offensive philosophy. When you draft your defensive philosophy, I would look for as many um, examples out there as you can find to help you out. Um, you definitely want values in there. You definitely want to say how you're going to stop the defense. So, for example, if I'm talking about my defensive philosophy, I might say, um, we're going to press on made, on made baskets because uh, that's going to create a, um, the psychology the psychology of that is going to create an advantage for our team. We are going to play help side man because um, of all the benefits of help side man. We are going to when we play help side man, we're going to uh, we're going to take away, uh, middle, we don't want that ball going middle. We're going to force sideline and baseline, and we're going to deny reversal to get easy stills. Um, we're going to, and and I might say, um, the most important values to me are deflections, our defensive rebounding, communication, hustle plays, and um, accountability. I might say something like that. Okay, and this is why. Okay. Uh, again, here's some examples. This is our uh, a draft. Now, this isn't very good yet. It still needs a lot of work, but a draft of our offensive and defensive philosophies from this last year in football. Um, and you guys have these slides, so you can look at those. Um, again, here's a draft 
or here's a published coaching philosophy example, and here's an offensive defensive philosophy. One of the things that I don't like as much with this offensive and defensive philosophy is um, they have a lot of values on here, but they don't really explain how they're going to stop the defense or the offense. So I think every philosophy should say exactly what your um, how your team is collectively going to stop the offense. Are you going to force baseline? Are you going to force help? Force weekend? When are you going to deny the pass, right? Um, are you going to deny reversals? Are you going to deny the initial pass, okay? So you got to make those decisions. Um, please fill out the packet before I, I meet you at, or at least attempt to draft. It doesn't need to be perfect, but you should have something written down so that when, when I meet with you guys, we can uh, talk about um, some of your ideas. And I'm hoping that when we meet, um, we can kind of solidify what you're thinking. Also, um, when we meet next week, uh, please answer the question, and you can. I would have it written down. Why or what from this year is your biggest success in coaching? Okay, what do you think is your biggest success in coaching? And then what has been your biggest challenge so far this year in coaching? Um, and we can kind of talk through those things, okay? Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you for all of the work that you guys and all the time. I know it's so much time and so much work um, in helping uh, these young athletes uh, be successful. Um, I'm rooting for you guys. I'd love to keep up with how your teams are doing. Again, don't be a stranger if you feel like uh, if if you want any uh, ideas to bounce off of me, okay? Um, when I, I know as a coach, there's nothing better than to have someone to bounce ideas off of. Uh, coach Justin and I bounce ideas off of each other all the time. He'll bounce off of uh, offensive plays and, and formations and ideas off of me, and I'll bounce off ideas for our, our defense. And it, it really helps us. Um, to try to get um, get better as coaches. So I'm here as a resource for you guys. Um, I'm happy if if we schedule it and I can uh, clear it with my home life. Uh, I'm happy to come to your practices if you guys uh, want me to to just help out with something or help implement something or help. Um, or just talk through things with you guys, okay? Um, yeah, keep in touch. I'm excited to see the second half of your guys' season. Uh, see you guys next week. Bye.